I couldn't be more delighted to welcome you all to our very first I Remember webinar. The aim of this evening is really to talk about all aspects of grief and death, but very much to focus on why it's important to prepare for our own deaths, how we can help our friends, families and loved ones prepare for our deaths and how that will help them with their grief and bereavement, and also how we can support people, friends, family, anybody we know who may have lost somebody that they love and they're currently grieving, how do we best support them through that? So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our two speakers this evening. The first is Dr. Catherine Mannix. After 40 years in healthcare and 30 in palliative care, Catherine took early retirement to work on changing public understanding of dying. She's broadcast on radio and television. She's written in a variety of newspapers, featured in numerous podcasts. Her book about the way people carry on living when they're dying with the end in mind has become a bestseller and has won the Welcome Book Prize. Catherine's also a proud supporter of Dying Matters. Welcome, Catherine. I'd also like to introduce Julie New. And after spending 23 years in nursing and midwifery, Julie followed her passion to become a personal recovery coach. And since 2006, she's helped literally hundreds of people to navigate difficult and sometimes traumatic life change. She regularly appears on the radio and she's published two books. The most recent, The Grief Garden Path, has been written to provide support and understanding to anybody experiencing the painful emotions related to grief and to help them live their lives once more to the full. The Grief Garden Path has been recognised by the Good Grief Trust and is their chosen read for 2020, a charity that Julie supports alongside Dying Matters. So welcome Julie, welcome Catherine. So we're going to kick off and have a conversation between the three of us. Um, and the first thing I want to reflect on really is around the title of this evening, because Dame Cicely Saunders, the founder of the modern hospice movement, famously said, the way that we die remains in the memories of those that live on. Catherine, starting with you, what does that quote mean for you? An absolutely fantastic quote, isn't it? So I just want to start by saying thanks for inviting us to do this. And hello to all these people who've come to join us, including a lot of very familiar names and faces. Great to have you all here. I think that that quote is the motor that took me into palliative care if i'm honest that seeing people unprepared at hospital bedsides when i was in acute medicine and then thinking about in the in the trainee stages of training in oncology what i saw troubled me when i looked at it through the lens of what families were seeing and there were so many questions after somebody had died that made me realize that what people had seen wasn't what I thought I had seen. I think that's when I first started to understand that unless you understand what is happening as somebody's dying, you interpret it to the best of your ability, often in a very scary way. And then that lives with you and, and literally haunts people for the rest of their lives. So there has to be something about making dying as comfortable as it can be, but there also has to be something about helping all of us to understand what the process of dying is about. Julie, what does it mean to you and why is it so important to talk about death and dying? Well, I think, um, as Catherine says, she, <clears throat> she very much comes from the, the before, so the, the dying bit. Um, I come from very much the grief side of it. So from the nanosecond that somebody dies, that their, their loved ones are on a path, a journey, which is called, we've called it grief, haven't we? Um, I call it a grief garden path because it's, it's to me, it's, it's a new path. It's a new journey that you're going on. But I think if you've, as Cecily says, you know, if you've, if you've had a, I think if you can call it a good experience of your your loved one dying, um, that can that can you know really help on the journey going forward. Um, I you know I've seen many many times um, people who are grieving that that haven't had that experience, and you know and 
having met Catherine and heard her speak um, and also obviously reading her book it's um it just shows doesn't it how just how important it is really um you know to have that support um yeah it definitely does and research shows that less than 30 percent of people have ever seen somebody die Catherine, in your book you really want to explore what it means for somebody to die what to expect why is it important to know beforehand what to expect I remember to unmute myself first. There's a fascinating thing that's happened, isn't there? Because of medicine becoming so clever, um, we've been able to stop people from dying of sepsis, for example, in, in midlife and get them better and send them back to work. Um, 20th century medicine made remarkable strides. And as it did that, two things happened um, the life expectancy of birth got much higher because people stopped dying of treatable things or things that became treatable over the 20th century which is fantastic so my my nana was born in 1900 life expectancy at birth for for girls in 1900 was about 48 um, so during the first half of the, the 20th century, she looked after dying siblings because she was a big sister, looked after dying parents. Uh, one of her children died at the age of seven from a, an illness that we routinely immunize children against now. Her husband died of sepsis. He had a burst appendix in his mid thirties. So her experience of dying and death was, was personal. It was intimate. She'd been there. She'd seen it. She knew what to expect. Nobody had to tell her that her husband was dying. She could see what was happening because she'd seen it before. So when things changed so dramatically over the second half of the 20th century, and I was talking to her about my job when she was nearly 97. So had almost twice outlived her life expectancy at birth. The thing that concerned her was that she was not going to live terribly much longer and her four surviving children had never seen somebody dying because they didn't remember their brother dying, they didn't remember their father dying and everybody else had benefited from this 20th century miracle. So my parents' generation is the generation that lost sight of ordinary dying. And now, how do we give people that back? So that's what I was trying to make a contribution towards. The way people understood it when they knew about it was because they'd seen it lots of times. And the way to help people to see it again is to tell them stories so that they can sit beside you, if you like, and you can narrate what's happened in a way that makes them mind about these people. So if you do it as case histories, if you do it as a leaflet, that's all, that's about giving information, that's kind of about telling, isn't it? Mm. Whereas if you, if you show through stories, by the end of a series of stories, people have seen it, heard it, seen it again, heard it again, understood it, taken it in, seen it again, adjusted their expectations. And, and that's what I'm setting out to do. And that's what I feel, I feel you've done so beautifully in your book, because every single story that you tell is just so personal. And it, I, I mean, first of all, it's testament to the amazing doctor that you are but also it's testament to the people, you know, that you, you've, you've walked alongside, that you've sat alongside, that you've cried with, that you've laughed with. I mean, there's a lot of laughter in your book, actually. <laughs> there's, um, you know, it's just, but the stories, I think stories are really powerful, aren't they? I, I think that's the way we learn, isn't it? That's the way we learn yeah. to understand things. That's a lovely thing to say about the book. Thank you. But I think, I think, for me it was it was a testimony to those fantastic people that I was part of looking after but yeah. the teamwork that surrounded them and surrounded me and I think one of the things that many disciplines probably feel like this but I can only really speak about palliative care is that when you're at the bedside or, or, or sitting beside the chair of, 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 of that patient even if you're the only person from the team who's physically present 
yeah. you are embodying the team. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about what would this particular nurse say if she was here with us now, or yeah. what would she ask me not to have forgotten to ask about when I get back to the team office, or what could our physio add to what's going on here? What would the OT bring? Mm -hmm. So, and, and similarly, you know, when, when the nurse comes back to the office and says, I've just been to see this patient and I'd, I'd like you to come because I want this piece of medical stuff to happen. Um, it's all about the teamwork and I hope oh, that those stories 100%. really talk about the teamwork no, because it's, it's, it's all about that. They absolutely do and you know I mean it's it brought you've just just you talking just then has just brought back um, an incredible memory for me um, about the day that my husband died um, eight years ago. So I've been doing my, just to put anybody that doesn't know my story at all in the picture, I'd been doing my work as a personal recovery coach for a very long time before, um, before he, he became very poorly. And it was, but you're absolutely right. I remember coming up from, from the chapel um, that day and I remember um, bumping into the consultant actually in the corridor and he said, Julie, he said, can I, you know, can I speak to you? I need to speak to you. I need to speak to you. And I, I, I'd actually had a conversation with, with his professor because um, he'd been in hospital for five months at that point. Um, and he said, oh, can he, can, can I? So they'd, they'd stopped dialysis. So uh, at all intents and purposes, they were, you know, they were preparing him for end of life care. And, uh, but they'd found another bug in his blood. And, um, I literally had to take the consultant's hand and I had to say, you need to let him go. Um, and he actually wanted to put a chest strain in as well. And Robert always said to me, please do not under any circumstances, let them put a chest strain in me because he'd already had a, a few of those before and it was just horrific. But I went, I remember going into the room, um, his breathing had changed and you talk about that quite a lot. Um, and I remember the healthcare assistant coming in, um, she was called Gadisi, and I, I got to know the staff incredibly well. Um, I was sleeping on the floor most of the time and um, I used to scare them when, I, when they used to come in. Um, I used to jump up and say hello in the morning and they'd forget I was down on the floor, you know. Um, but she just took my hand and I just remember just sobbing, sobbing. Um, because I knew, I knew, you know, his life was, was ebbing ebbing away um, and then the person who had known Rob a very very longer than me actually um, he used, she used to be his district nurse came on night duty and she was with us when he took his last breath and he was in my arms um, so that teamwork and I think teamwork is so incredibly important you know and you know to have that that level of care um, at the end of somebody's life really impacts the memories that we 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 then take forward um, because I can look back um, I can look back now with a smile on my face when I think of Rob um, I don't look back with a tear in my eye anymore because I've done an awful lot of work going forward which I'm sure we'll talk about but um, um, yeah so so the team team oh I mean the the teams are just incredible yeah yeah. Julie, how did knowing what to expect or having an idea what to expect, how did that help you when you were grieving for Robert? And, and what would you recommend to people who are facing this in terms of how much should they find out beforehand? What, what does help in your experience? Well, I suppose, I mean, I, I, um, I think it's very different when it's somebody that you love. Um, I mean, Catherine's just talked about her grandmother. Um, I've just talked about my husband. So it's, I think from from the perspective of somebody who isn't isn't medical I think it's just really love I mean the way Catherine describes um the change in the breathing and that that somebody is not um particularly aware of what's actually happening to them I think is actually very reassuring it's really reassured me actually because I now know that Rob was he was he was in a very, very deep sleep. He was, you know, he was, he was just, he was very comfortable. Um, and I, 
I hadn't really ever thought about it like that yeah. before. Um, Catherine, I, th I think you, you need to say something about that. Because I think you say, it, you say it so beautifully. You really do. It's, it's a fascinating thing, isn't it? I started off in, in general medicine and uh, oncology and doing exams and, and all of that stuff. And then, then found my way into working in a hospice uh, because I didn't think that finding the cure for cancer was turning out to be as exciting as I had thought it might be. It seemed to be mainly um, taking blood and drawing graphs. Um, and, and what was really interesting was the people who, who were not going to get cured, but actually wanted every moment to count. That, that was just so yeah. much more interesting. So um, I, I went to work in a, in a local hospice. And in those days, we didn't even have the expression palliative medicine. It hadn't been invented yet. It was just called hospice care or being a hospice doctor. So I went off to do that with quite a lot of experience. You know, I've been qualified for four years I, because I've been working towards um, a, a cancer kind of career. I'd worked in the cancer center for a year. I'd worked in the regional um, leukemia center for several stints of jobs at different junior grades. So I'd seen a lot of people dying enough people that you might call the police under different circumstances kind of thing um, and yet when I first heard my new boss in the hospice explain what was going to happen to a lady who was really terrified of being overwhelmed by pain as she was dying I was completely unprepared for what I heard and I had probably seen I don't know maybe a couple of hundred people die by then and she was frightened. She was an astonishing person. We were all a little bit terrified of her. She was French and she was elegant and she was glorious. And she had been in the French resistance and she'd married a British airman and become his, his French bride, but she'd never lost her really strident French accent, which I can't possibly reinterpret for you here because I'll just sound like a really bad episode of Allo Allo but it, sometimes it was quite hard to understand what she was saying um, and she was particularly fond of the the medical director of our hospice um, because his family had been French were French and he was fluently bilingual um, so when she confessed to one of the nurses that she was terrified of this pain the nurse did something really important, which was to ask her to say more instead of saying, oh, well, you don't have to worry about pain, you know, because you're in the hospice and we're really good at that. Mm -hmm. um, so this lady explained to the nurse that if she were to be overwhelmed by pain on her deathbed, then she might despair. And because she was a French Roman Catholic, if she were to despair on her deathbed, that would be what she called a mortal sin. And that would mean she wouldn't go to heaven. And her husband, who died about 10 years before, she believed was definitely in heaven. He'd had a heart attack. He'd been awake uh, for a few hours after his heart attack. He had said all of the prayers with the priest. He'd been a very very good man all his life in her opinion so he was in heaven waiting for her and she might not get to heaven if she was overwhelmed by pain so our our boss said oh well come on we better go and see her and um i was a bit surprised that he wanted me to go because you know i knew a lot about pain because i passed exams because i must have been about 28 then which is i think the age when you think you know everything and then you spend the rest of your life just discovering how much more there is to so, you know you, you all know how it is so I, I go along and when he gets her to explain to him that she's afraid of pain at the end of her life um, I thought he was then going to do a pain explanation instead of which he said to her well sounds like you're expecting something much worse than we're expecting would you like me to explain what we see when people are dying mm -hmm. And my head nearly exploded with with horror. You know, how how could you how could you possibly do that? Um, and she said yes, she would like him to. 
and he proceeded to give that explanation and I was sitting on one of those little footstool things on the floor beside the bed so I could see both of them but really I just wanted to collapse into a black hole and disappear under the bed because I just felt so awkward but what he did was to explain how generally the first thing that people notice whatever the illness is that we're being brought to our death by the main thing we notice is that we're just more tired we haven't got as much energy um he said to you might already be noticing that and when she said yes or when she said we um he said well that's good and i didn't think that that's good was a really good thing to say but it didn't seem to bother her he said that's good because that shows us that you're following the usual pattern um and he said so the next thing that we see is that um People need more sleep to help them to be awake in between times. It gives them more energy. Have you noticed that you get recharged by a sleep? And she said, we. Oui. Um, and he said, well, that's, that's wonderful. You're following the pattern. So the next thing that we expect is just you'll be more tired. You'll sleep for longer. You'll be awake for less time. But when you are awake, you will probably be about as awake as you are now because this illness isn't affecting your mind, it isn't affecting your brain. And as time goes by, we see people sleep more and they're awake less. And then we start to realize they're not just asleep, they're dipping in and out of being unconscious. Mm -hmm. And there was a pause while he asked her whether she wanted that said in French, because he wanted to make sure she really understood. Um, and then he said, so if, you, if your nieces and nephews are around the bed because she hadn't had children which was a great sadness to her but if your nieces and nephews are around the bed what they will see is and now i'm really thinking oh dear goodness somebody's got to stop this man this is terrible and she's just sitting up higher and higher her eyes are just locked on his eyes she's holding his hand she's stroking his hand she's nodding she's absolutely in this conversation mm. And he said, so what they'll see is if, if you're unconscious, eventually the only bit of the brain that's working is the bit that works our breathing. And at that point, breathing just becomes automatic. It's just a reflex and it moves between fast and slow, between deep and shallow, moves between those phases. And some of the time, because we don't notice our throat, when we breathe out, our throat's a bit tight. It makes a noise, sounds a bit like a sigh. So we'll check that you're not uncomfortable, but almost certainly it will simply be because you're unconscious and you're not noticing your throat. And some of the time, the breathing might be a little bit more rapid and more shallow. And we'll check that you're not breathless, but almost certainly it won't be breathlessness. It will be deep unconsciousness and just this automatic breathing. And at the very end of somebody's life, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, let me disappear. And he keeps going. At the very end of somebody's life, all we see is that after one of those breaths out, there just isn't another breath in. It, it's no more remarkable than that. Yeah. There's no sudden rush of pain at the end, no feeling of fading away, no panic, none of those things that she was dreading. No. And she just settled back against her pillows and she closed her eyes and she relaxed and she said, thank you. And she picked his hand up and she kissed his hand. Oh. And then she just kind of indicated that, you know, she'd, she'd finished with us now. We could, you know, we were dismissed. So, so as we went off down the corridor and he said to me, are you okay? And I said, yes. Um, I went to make tea, which was the beginning of my palliative care tea drinking career. Um, and just reflected on that. What I just heard was the description of every death that I'd ever seen, but I hadn't noticed it before because I'd been the junior doctor trying to stop the person dying. So, so, so you know, worrying about somebody's haemoglobin and somebody else's oxygen, somebody else's... Isn't, yeah, isn't yeah. it interesting? Because I remember as, um, as a student nurse doing my, my training, and I remember consciously thinking in my last year of training, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm knowing that somebody's going into shock because I just know. But whereas at the beginning, you, you only know that because you've done their blood pressure, you've taken their pulse, you know, you... Yeah it's and like a diabetic you know you 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 kind of know because you've done their blood sugar whereas in the end it's it's just something that comes so naturally to you and i think yeah. i think that that's that's what's so powerful about the way you describe um the way that we die 
Um, obviously, 25% of deaths aren't, we don't have that luxury um, mm. you know, because it happen, It can happen very suddenly, it can happen very traumatically. So I think that it's, but, but even then, there's still a process of death, isn't there? There absolutely is. And we're going to remember that, you know, of, of the 25% who don't have that kind of run in over weeks and then changing by day and then changing by hour, yeah. almost all of those people are still people who know they've got an illness that's life limiting. And if eventually their heart disease leads them not to a gentle heart failure death, but to a more sudden heart well, rhythm this, change death. As, as you know, Catherine, this happened to me, didn't mm. it? In June, well, not me personally, <laughs> it, but it happened to my brother, uh, my younger brother, uh, Richard, very sadly passed away, didn't I? Mm. I've shared this with, with Catherine um, back in June. And uh, yeah, it was incredibly sudden, absolutely out of the blue. Um, I got a phone call. Um, but even then, the, the process for me, um, when I got down there, I was one of the first to be let into the house. You know, even then, if we go back to the teams, you know, the, the police officer that was there, the, um, the undertakers that arrived to pick, pick, up his, his, pick him up, take his body to they were all so fantastic we were very very blessed and very lucky um but you know just that gentle questioning the paramedics that were there you know it i, I think it's the team thing it's it's i think we have to realize and remember the importance of the impact that we make as professionals on somebody's journey yeah. You know, even even when it's sudden and it can be, you know, traumatic. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, you know, most people will not die in a hospice. Only about 10% of deaths yeah. will take place in a hospice. But you don't need hospice levels of care yeah. to enable somebody's physical comfort to be sufficient that their dying trajectory is interrupted by pain. Yeah. And so when people yeah. have seen difficult dying, and we mustn't pretend that there isn't difficult dying. Of course, every now and again, there's somebody who just has a really, really awful time. That's very, very rare. And usually, if we can manage the physical symptoms well, yeah. then that gradual descent down into comfortable unconsciousness isn't disturbed by people waking themselves up because they're pain has come back or the breathlessness has come back or whatever um so I'm, I'm just noticing there's a couple of things on the chat about you know let's let's not get too um rosy eyed about this and i think we have to just challenge a little bit the perception that we are being rosy eyed what i'm describing mm. is ordinary dying what i'm describing is the dying that i'd seen hundreds of times in hospital when there were no palliative care teams and i recognized it in that description in yeah. at that hospice bedside this is the way humans have died since time immemorial this is the way guinea pigs die this is the way you know all animals die unless they're unless sorry they're i love, I love guinea pigs <laughs> so so you know there is there is a process of bodies closing down and eventually uh, their breathing stops and then of course a few minutes later their heart stops because it isn't getting oxygen anymore because the breathing has stopped yeah. so there's the other public education issue that we need to think about a cardiac arrest where cpr you know cardiopulmonary resuscitation is really important first aid to save somebody's life who might be saved and about one person in ten will have their life saved if they get CPR in time. That's, some, that's a situation where the heart stops and everything else is still working and the person collapses because their heart has stopped. But at that point, their brain has still got oxygen in, their kidneys are still working, their lungs are still working, CPR is the right first aid. At the end of that process of dying, everything has switched itself off. And then the heart stops. 
CPR isn't a treatment at that point, but we mix everybody up by saying, oh, well, we need a, a no CPR certificate. Um, this isn't a cardiac arrest, it's dying. We, we, got, we need to sort this conversation out about resuscitation, ordinary dying. Yeah, I, I had, um, I, it was quite interesting. I, I was uh, down in Dorset with, um, with my sister and my mum and dad. And um, on the way home, we went to visit um, a very dear friend of my dad's. They'd known each other for, I think, 60 years something something like that met as very young men um, and he'd lost his wife um, she died um, and my parents wanted to give a, the gift of my book to him and towards the end of us being with him um, I sat with him and this is so yeah well, we were sat near him um, and he he started crying and I said to him, why, why are you crying? And uh, obviously he then shared with me that he, his wife had had dementia for 10 years and she'd been bed bound for four of those years. And the carer that had been part of his, that, who was actually on duty when she stopped breathing, started resuscitating her. Then she rang, he then in, in a panic rang 999 paramedics arrived they saw that they were doing active resuscitation they started so they broke all her ribs she it was just the most horrific experience but they actually brought her back um, and she died in hospital four days later and he the thing that he was most upset about was the fact that she was not at home when she died and I took I took his hand and I said look I completely understand how traumatic that memory was for you, but I want you to think about it in a different way. And he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? And I said, she was with you. I said, she was in your arms when she died. I said, she was home. She was home. She was with you. And he just sobbed and he said, you're right you know she she was home yeah. and so i think what we have to remember is that you know going forward from the the death it's from that nanosecond they're on that journey then you know he's on that journey um of grief of pain um and there'll be some you know there'll be good days there'll be bad days there'll be everything in between um, but I just felt I needed to say that to him, yeah. you know, that he, he was yeah. home. It, it, was it's, home. Re it's really fascinating, isn't it? There's some great research came out of a straight, uh, out of New Zealand a couple of years ago, looking at exactly this. We know that if you ask, um, you know, if we did a poll of everybody on this call now, where would you like to be when you, when you die? About 70% of people would say, I want to be at home. And those of us who, work in care of the elderly, general practice, um, palliative care. We all know that there are people who are in hospital towards the end of their lives and we're thinking, oh, we need to get this person home. We'll say, for heaven's sake, don't send me home. You know, this is fine. I know all the nurses here. My husband has got to worry about doing all the washing. Uh, my, my, my wife doesn't have to um, carry things up and down the stairs for me this is fine can't I just stay here so we do change our minds towards the end of life and that's why I think the process of planning ahead and thinking in advance about what we like it can't be a one-off event can it we we have to you know right now I'm fairly young I think I'd like to be looking out of this window at my apple tree when I'm dying um, but you know, if it's in another 30 years time and my husband's in his 90s, it might just be easier for everybody if we're not. So we're going to have to just keep revising that. Evaluate, re-evaluating, yeah. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, with Rob, he, he, anybody that knew him, you know, knew that he always wanted to be at home. That was, you know, yeah. that was absolutely... It was his worst nightmare to be in hospital because he'd had he was paralysed from mid chest in 1992, so he'd had he'd got a massive medical history, and 
so if he went into hospital he used to have to regale all this and you know it was it was really, you know but he and he always just wanted to be at home and uh for him not to be at home to, when he died mm. um it was like he was at home in in a lot of respects because i was there his mum was there my mum was there um and you know my dad and we took it in turns to be you know be be in the room yeah. um but yeah it's it, it's it's just every experience is different and i think that's mm. that's the other point that i i wanted to make tonight is that everybody's journey is different everybody everybody's journey is unique to them um but it's so important that you know people have to, you know to make those memories um and to take those forward it's it's just so important you know that, that people get the right care they get, they get the right support absolutely so support and, and, is that, absolutely key. and that they get the right explanations as they're going yeah. through isn't it yeah. so so this research from, from yeah. new zealand was saying that actually at the very end of life what when you go and talk to people at the very end of life what they say is actually doesn't matter where the bed is doesn't matter where the room is that the bed is in what matters is who's around the bed exactly exactly what you are yeah. saying yeah. and so when in bereavement you and other people who work in in grief support are helping people to make sense of it i often feel that in a way what we're asking you to do is help people build a jigsaw that makes sense of everything that they and, saw. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I when I start working with people, um, it can be quite early on um, after somebody's died, or it could be, you know, 11, 12 years later, to Stephen Regal, um, who's a professor um, in Nottingham. He, he very eloquently um, describes a lot of his, his patients are referred to him often after very traumatic sudden deaths um, at about 11 years. Um, so on that journey between when somebody dies and, and when they're beginning to see a chink of light in the distance, one of the tools that I work with is, you know, the life being a bit like a garden, which is what, where the, the, the garden path bit comes from. Because, you know, all the different people that are gonna be on your journey going forward, um, there are going to be people that will walk across the other side of the road because they don't understand and they don't they don't know what to say and it's often you 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 know you can benefit from I mean I was widowed for example at, at the age of 45 and I found great comfort from an amazing Facebook group who it was full of widows <laughs> and um, you know and they they got me they got me um you know it's the same with you know if you lose a baby or a child you know to, to actually have that kind of people that really understand what it is that you're going through those kind of uh, you know everybody's as i say everybody's journey is different um but the support that you get on that journey is 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 paramount not often actually when i work with people they will have um they will have already seen you know they've been, have been looked back on the garden path behind them which because i don't do that bit um if if i feel that somebody needs to see a counselor or psychotherapist or whatever and actually you know now that i'm working online um i i, I actually need more counselors and psychotherapists to be able to refer to because it's so important, you know, but it's also important to have that support, that, that arm around you. That's what I do. It's a virtual arm um, around people to help them yeah. gently move forward when they're ready towards you, that Julie. chink of light. Sorry, Julie. So, sorry, sorry, Tracy. No, I've just, so much of this is coming down to communication, isn't it? And people saying what it is that's really on their mind. Julie, I'm really struck by you saying that some people after a traumatic death wait 11 years before they seek out the help they need. It's, it's actually not waiting 11 years. It's, it's sometimes it, the shock can, be, can actually last that long. And it's only then that the actual 
emotions are starting to surface. So that's and so they they're starting to feel and they 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 could perhaps go to their doctor and they say I feel really depressed. I feel really tearful. I I really I'm really angry about this. And then suddenly, you realise that it's it's actually what happened all those years ago that has caused mm -hmm. so it's not it's generally not that they haven't they haven't waited that long it's the fact that the the, the actual grief sort of the emotional side of grief hasn't manifested itself does that kind of make sense it does I'm, I'm wondering do people ever worry about shocking you and that's a question to both of you because i'm thinking also about the french lady Catherine. you talked about you would have had no idea what her concern was if she hadn't said it. You would never would have guessed that that was her concern. And because this comes down to communication, if you're, if you're able to say what it is that's worrying you, whether you're a relative or whether you're facing your own death, then the explanations can be there. So I mean, is it possible to shock a counsellor or a palliative care doctor? Or is it just important to just say what it is in that moment you're really feeling and just get it out? What a great question. That's a really I, good question. <laughs> Do you want to go first? <laughs> well, I, so I, I would say that if we're going to be good helpers, it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what our job is. It doesn't matter how many qualifications we've mm. got. Mm. If you can listen, yeah. then you can help. I was always Cause... taught if you, you've got two ears and one mouth, use them in that order, Julie. Yeah, that's what I was that's told. A, respect the ratio, absolutely. <laughs> and one of the things that I learned from my cognitive therapy practice was that um, people won't go for the thing that is the most shocking thing they're thinking to start off with. They'll, it's almost like getting into the cold sea. They'll put their toes in a bit and see whether you jump. And if you remain open and carry on listening, they'll tell you a bit more. And yeah. a bit more yeah. and so to to invite them to say a little bit more so one of the things when palliative care people are talking to um, non-palliative care staff to teach them communication skills is to encourage people to to talk about what's the thing that's worrying them what do they feel is the worst thing that could happen and people say, oh, I don't want to ask them that because they might say I'm going to die. I said, well, actually, do you know what? That probably isn't the worst thing that can happen. So when a person says, and, and you know, and the worst thing is I'm going to die, then there's another question after that, which is, what is it about the idea that you're going to die or that your parent is going to die or that your spouse is going to die? What is it about that that is the most troubling thing for you? And it's only then that you really start to have the conversation about the thing that really bothers that person. And for some people, like it was for that lady, it was about hell and judgment and not being yeah. worthy. And, in not a, in being a, with, and not being with her loved one. Yeah. Not and for, so, and for, for some people, it's something, you know, I, I looking after a young mum who, who said, but it's about not being there as my children grow up and you think as a mum oh that is the worst thing but no trust trust the model what is the worst thing about that for you and there was this very very long pause before she was able to collect herself enough to say there's nobody to tell my daughter about periods now you couldn't guess that could you as somebody's worst dread but her daughter was too young for the conversation and she was not going to survive until her daughter was old enough for the conversation so now we've got to think about problem solving that so she's handing over that responsibility and and entrusting it to somebody so i don't think we can be shocked and even if we are shocked no. so what actually yeah. this is about the person we're trying to help julie what what do you think i i i always say <laughs> sounds a bit, bit bit funny but i always say nothing ever shocks me it genuinely doesn't i i think because it's somebody it's somebody else that's that's going through that and what i'm there for is to facilitate and to help them to explore that that situation um i mean i don't just work with people who um, are bereaved although grief usually comes into the the work that i do but it's 
I don't think anything does does really shock me as such but I, I think I think that then allows people to um, to talk more openly because they know that they can do that and and I always say a good a good coach or a good counsellor or a good therapist a good doctor <laughs> good nurse you know if we ask good questions we get good answers don't we because it just yeah if you ask a good question you're you're generally you're opening up a conversation and and yes I think I think you're right Tracy I think it is all about communication um, and I think that you know that's that's how we we just started a conversation didn't we Catherine we over, did we just over, struck it up Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I, but you know that that's that's how friendships start that's how um you know relationships start you know it all starts over a conversation doesn't it it does it does do you think i mean thinking about relationships or thinking about friends family and and, and sort of wider society do you think that we have societal expectations about what grief should look like and do you think that that sometimes inhibits people that they feel that they need to act in line with some kind of expectation you ask it should i shall i answer that yeah. yeah um i don't know i i think people don't what people have got from my book actually is apparently is like an understanding i think if people have an understanding of what to expect and how to, and you know everybody's journey is different but on that journey you're going to experience certain emotions just say um i mean they they were identified by elizabeth kubler ross back in the day um and i just remember i remember le learning that as a as a student nurse you know that we go through stages and, and people don't really like that anymore they look that but I, the way i look at it is is that there are certain you know emotions that you're going to feel and i think if you if you know you know like i remember feeling really really angry um i wrote a blog this week about my daughter polly um i mean she was angry for about five years um mm -hmm. <laughs> and and when she suddenly wasn't angry anymore it was you know we were still waiting for for the for the anger to come so i think grief can really change you as a person over a period of a long period of time so i think it's if you understand it though i think it, it possibly makes it a bit easier to um navigate if you like um because you realize you you're, you're not going mad or you're not you know because sometimes you can just feel as though you're losing your head um you know on that grief garden path on that journey it's just it's just awful mm. and also, also i think that people who have not being closely bereaved who've had that good fortune in life mm, yeah. probably don't quite get how completely life-changing it is and how and, yeah. and i certainly didn't so i i was in practice for for in palliative care for probably 20 years before i had my first real life-altering bereavement um, and of course, it didn't feel anything like I had known it was going to feel because I'd seen it so many times. Um, do you know, not like that at all. And then, of course, my my next several bereavements, none of them have been like the previous ones. Yeah. So we, so you just don't know. You can't mm. see how mm. it's going to be. But I think there's there's a, a a belief that in some way bereavement is um, a particular process that once you've got past all of the firsts it's not quite quite so bad about that and you hear people saying things like oh well you know she's stuck now it's probably pathological grief now because this 40 year old woman's not over the death of her 12 year old son three years later you know she's yeah. never going to be over uh because actually you don't you're going to be grieving for as long as you would would have been loving you well, are still I, loving yeah, aren't you I, that's what yeah, it is absolutely and you and, and that that's the point i get people to is the understanding that the love hasn't died because when somebody dies they're they're physically not here anymore and that is the most difficult thing you know um 
but it's it's eventually and i do really believe this eventually you reach a point where you remember the love you remember the person you remember it's about you know this this is what this is all about today it's about memories it's about i remember yeah. you know oh i remember oh, i remember that and i oh I, oh yes i remember that and you know it it's it, it's something that yeah you 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 just take eventually you reach that point yeah 